Hi, everyone, and thank you for being here. I'm joined by Deb Roy, professor at MIT, and Bertine Saha, a VP at AWS, that is Amazon's cloud unit. And Bertine, as we were walking up here, you remarked, couldn't even imagine having this panel eight months ago, yeah, let alone only standing room. This has been this sort of wild phenomena, chat, GPT, and BARD, and the rise of generative AI over the last eight months or so. Maybe a quick show of hands before we get started. Um, who in the room has incorporated some kind of chatbot or large language model into their everyday life? Who uses it maybe once or twice a week? Wow. Wow. It's a lot of people. Do you, a show of hands, do you search as much? OK, so maybe you can have one, the other. Um, but we thought we would start, sort of go back a little bit and explain what this is, where it comes from, why this has exploded into our space eight months. And you had a really good way of describing it, um, Bertine. Maybe you could explain to the audience. Sure. Uh, and thanks, Dee, for having me. And thanks to the uh, festival organizers for having us. So the way we think about generative AI and these large language models, it's, it's really just an evolution in AI that we have been seeing for a very long time. Uh, to give you some context around how fast this field has been moving, if you look at the IT revolution, what drove um, the whole internet revolution, it was driven by Moore's law. You know, and that said, the amount of compute used to double every 18 months. Over the last five to six years, the amount of compute that we use in AI has been doubling every three and a half months. Okay. That's six times the speed at which IT was going. So you go back you know, 30 years, then a lot of the companies that we're familiar with now, you know, Amazon, Google, Twitter, Facebook, Meta, they weren't even there. And so what has really happened is this field has grown enormously because simply the amount of innovation and the compute innovation we have been able to see. And because of the amount of compute innovation we have been able to see, we are able to take these models, these large language models D, and are able to train it with massive amounts of internet scale data. And that is what gives them the ability to be able to give you the information you want. Now, to give you some sense of the scale of this information, if you take an average human being, if you take one of us, we will listen to probably a billion words in a lifetime. We train these models with trillions of words. It's 1,000 times more than a human being is going to listen in the lifetime. You know, we train it with everything that's there in the Wikipedia and all of that internet scale data. And so ultimately, the real point that I wanted to get across is, you know, it's yet another point in the continuum of AI innovation we have been seeing, yet another point in the continuum of IT innovation we have been seeing. And it's just the amount of data and the internet scale data that we're able to use it that allows you to answer and give you information in this way. And then there's a bunch of other techniques we use in terms of training it with humans yeah. that allows you to give the kind of answers. Those kinds of numbers, they're hard to get your head around. They're just so enormous. And we're only eight months into this sort of exercise, which is consumer facing. Deb, how has that changed sort of the way we do things, our daily habits so far? Well, can I just make one more comment about just to maybe build a bit of the intuition of what's going on yeah. with these models? And of course, uh, probably many of you are aware that there is a prehistory before eight months of a kind of continuous development of this style of uh, machine learning. Um, maybe some of you have heard in the media that the way these large language models work is they just predict the next word. Uh, have, has anyone here heard that explanation? Yeah, so, so I find that that doesn't quite get at the actual intuition of, because if you're, you know, most of you are playing with uh, ChatGPT or uh, probably ChatGPT, um, it seems to have this intelligence. Um, so I think um, if you just to build the intuition a little bit of what's going on, because it feels magical, um, if I asked you right now, if I said there's a, a random word on a page of text, um, and I've selected it secretly, guess what the word is? Uh, what would you guess? <laughs> The, I the. heard that. <laughs> so you've just recalled, based on probability, the most frequent word. If I said the, that, you're right. The word is that. What's the next word? It's going to be a little harder, but you might guess some common noun. <clears throat> the more context I give you, the dog was acting erratic. Suddenly, it jumped up at me and, and you might say, bit. 
or some other. So what's happening with these machines with all of this incredible you know, internet scale data, you feed the, a copy of the internet, and more and more powerful machines that can take huge amounts of context and predict the next word. When you do that task, you're bringing more and more semantics and world knowledge into that prediction of that next word. What seems to be happening with these models is that they are actually building similar kinds of knowledge of language and of the world and common sense and all the rest that in ways that are actually mysterious to everyone, including the people actually developing the model. Mysterious is a really important word, though. Maybe that's a generous <laughs> way of describing it. Um, but we don't always know where they're pulling from. So you get all the knowledge that exists on the internet. So you're getting the good stuff and the not so good stuff. As human beings, they discussed this in the last panel a little bit. How do we keep up with that? And how do you keep up with that in a business scenario? When everyone, every CEO is asking, what's our AI strategy? But we don't understand it even fully ourselves yet. So as Dev was saying, um, you know, there's a, there is a really long phase where you take these models and you verify what they're doing. And it's actually done by humans. So, you know, someone is going and asking them a question, an answer comes out, and then you say, is this how a human would have answered this? And so you're training the model to give it those right answers. Now, before you train the model, now you've taken this entire internet scale data. Now, a lot of the data on the internet may not be reliable, may not be good. And so you have, before you train these models, there's this huge operation where you go in and you inspect the data, you clear, you filter the data out of toxic material, out of inaccurate material, out of biased material, and so on. So there's a lot of effort that goes in into making sure that you are training these models with the right kind of data, and then after the models are making predictions that you're actually checking and validating the output that it makes reasonable sense. And now, you know, there's still some times when the LLMs haven't, there might be some cases when they don't really give the answers you want. And over time, the technology is going to keep getting better and better and keep going to get deployed. But there's a lot of work D that goes on in ensuring the reliability of the inputs mm -hmm. and the outputs. But if a, if a human only hears a billion words in their lifetime and these models are being trained on trillions and trillions of words, how does a human ever keep up? Yeah. How can you ever verify? I, and I guess the point is that you can't. Well, the thing is, humans aren't starting from scratch, hmm. right? There's our, our whole evolutionary history and all sorts of you know, biases to learn certain kinds of things that, are, um, yeah, that we're building on top of. So then, and then life experience uh, layers on top. Um, I just wanted to uh, um, explain why I use the word mysterious. There's actually two kinds of mysteries. One, which you just talked about, is every time the next bigger model is trained, um, one of the mysteries is what has it learned, mm -hmm. uh, which is actually a kind of extraordinary situation that through the whole history of machine learning, the task was known to the human uh, engineers or researchers, but how to get, how to program the computer to solve that task was the problem, that the machine learning would automatically program itself. But this strange new thing is happening with these very large models, which is the emergence of new skills that no human set as the task. Mm -hmm. So that's one mystery, which is um, what new things has this gigantic new model actually yeah. learned? Um, and so there's kind of emergent abilities. And then a lot of the kind of risk assessment, what kind of errors is it making? We just heard it this morning, for those of you in the session, around hallucination. Um, very easy to get ChatGPT to hallucinate. Um, it's uh, very often with names of things that kind of are made up. Um, the other mystery is just how do these uh, models actually work? So there's active research now in the equivalent of fMRI, where you go and try to visualize and understand what the internal representations, what, how is this machine, this AI actually representing knowledge. And um, it's, uh, it's indecipherable right now. So Let Bertine, me add one other yeah, thing please. to that, Dee. Um, a lot of the research now and a lot of the products now are getting to a point where we say the output of the model should be grounded. Now, what does grounding mean? It means that when the model is giving you an output, it should tell you the sources of information. And so a lot of the systems that we are building at Amazon now, for example, uh, when they give an output, 
they say, here is where I got this information from. And so one way to think about it is you can think about these generative AI products or these models as assistants, mm -hmm. uh, where they're assisting a human in various tasks. So they're kind of making it easier and faster for you to do the research. Like you don't have to go and search 10 different websites. It gets the information for you. And then it says, you know, here is where I got it from. Here is where I got it from. So you can go and then verify whether that's the right thing or not. Think, can you do that with a model at scale? Can a chat GPT do can. that if yes. you insert so that So the way we are building it at Amazon, um, we have been... You know, one of the things that we've really put a lot of attention to is these models should be ready for use at enterprise scale. And what that means is all of the questions that DU are asking or DevU are pointing out, which is how do we make sure that the outputs are reasonable, are verifiable? This is really top of mind for us. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's... That's what I think a lot of the industry is going to be focused on. I will say that hallucinations are not all bad. I checked this morning, and then ChatGPT <laughs> awarded me a MacArthur again. So. <laughs> 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 okay, well, I, you know, this is exactly where I was going. Some people call these hallucinations. Others people call this creativity. And it's an interesting question where I live and work in Silicon Valley, right? Um, a lot of technologists want to say that there's only opportunity here, and that outweighs all of the risks. And I mean, how do you paint these yeah. things in our society that's polarized too? Your hallucination may just, ChatGPT was being creative with you this morning. Yeah. It may be true. It, it was, yeah. As soon as I asked, when did I get that MacArthur, it backed off and said, I apologize. <laughs> Did I, did I say that? And and because uh, it has. It is very uh, flattering, though, yeah. I will say. But you know, this is another cool thing: is that for um, everyone who's like, you know played with it, what an incredible mm -hmm. tool it is for creativity. Another just like a little insight into how the model works. I ask you to guess what the next word is, um, and after the could come many uh, many possible words. There's something called a temperature term <clears throat> in these models. If you set the temperature to zero the model will always predict the most likely next word based on its experience of all the data. But when you're using ChatGPT by default, the temperature is not set to zero. And the higher the temperature, the more likely it is sometimes to pick a word that's less likely. And that seems to be what leads to very creative different kinds of outputs. You sort of get a pretty boring output, but as you turn the temperature up, you get more and more uh, kind of meandering paths through. So Bertine, what does that mean in a business setting? AWS is doing it. Actually, first, could you describe the approach that Amazon is taking versus a Google and a Microsoft, which is pretty well known to this audience? You can see and use and touch, you know, BARD and ChatGPT. What's Amazon doing? So, you know, the first thing is that Amazon, we are really focused on our customers, not what competitors are doing. Um, now, that said, we think it's really important to give customers the choice and the flexibility. Well, your customer is the enterprise, too, the at AWS. The, uh, the choice and the flexibility. And what that means is we don't think one model is the best for all purposes. You know, there are many situations, like you want to do image generation, you want to do in one particular way. You might want to, many of our customers, enterprises, they want to take these models and they want to be able to train it on their own data. Now, I'll give you an example. Uh, we have some of the largest pharma companies they want to be able to enable the researchers to do drug discovery faster. So when you're trying to do drug discovery, one of the things that the researchers is trying to do is say, looking at their internal treasure trove of data, all of the experiments that they've done before, and said, well, was there a side effect of this molecule of this drug with this kind of a thing? Now, today, what does the researcher have to do? They have to go in, they have to scan all the documents. And for those of us you know, who are working in these industries, it's like spread all over the place. Some of it is inconsistent and so on. What these companies want to do is say, give me a chat kind of an interface where the researcher will simply be able to type, give me the results of all experiments in the last 10 years where we did this. And so when you think about it, a lot of these companies are saying, I want to be able to train the models on my proprietary data. 
Okay, and because it's my proprietary data, I don't want to make it available to you. So there are going to be very different ways in which companies and customers want to use it. And so the most important thing from our perspective is to give customers choice and flexibility. And that is why we have come out with Amazon Bedrock, where we give customers our own models, Amazon Titan models, as well as models from a lot of third-party companies. So it's not just Amazon, it's a lot of third-party companies and open source models. So, you know, there's AI21, there's uh, uh, Anthropic, there's stability.ai. And I think that that tenet of it's not just one company, it's not just one model, but it's going to be a broad partnership with others where we want to give customers choice and flexibilities. I think what differentiates Amazon in our view is really, really, really important. You mentioned something important there, the idea that people want to hold on to the proprietary data. Yeah. That is the gold in this sort of generative AI shift. So, Deb, does that create more walls ultimately? Right now, everyone is sort of, everything is open, but companies, individuals are learning that the data is really valuable. And if you give it to a model like OpenAI, it's going to take that for everyone, right? Versus being able to monetize it themselves. I mean, it does create walls, but walls are sometimes a good thing, um, or boundaries. Um, and, um, uh, you know, rules of consent for how that data can flow and be used. So just like, a, a, so it makes sense if a company's got proprietary data that they're not going to want it out there. And there's this whole process called fine tuning. So you can take a large language model that's been trained on the internet and then you can tune it up and it takes much less uh, power and effort. And you do that with your proprietary data, that makes sense. Uh, it also makes sense down to, you know, uh, individuals, if you have your personal data. Right, and there's obviously been a lot of discussions in the social media space around who owns the data and data dignity and, on, and sort of the business models that actually leverage personal data. All of that carries over to large language models. There's an interesting analogy. We've had 20 years of uh, you know, exploring and discovering both the pluses and the minuses of social media. There's a, a very straightforward, in my mind, analogy, which is, um, Social media experiences are based on uh, user-generated data, and then AI algorithms create a kind of experience which are undigested bits of content coming from different places, and the AI figures out how to kind of program your newsfeed. <clears throat> Generative AI is digesting all that content. So there's a synthesis step, which is extraordinary in terms of the advance, but the logic in terms of walls and data and ownership and all of the rest um, there's a, a really clear analogy in my mind. And so thinking about how do you give consent for your data to be used, and then one of the challenges which separates social media and gen with generative AI, I think the kind of issues around intellectual property and data mm -hmm. rights becomes much more complex, is once I give consent, if the machine learns based on my data and synthesizes it, there's no meaningful way for me to reach back in and get right. out. And who owns right? the new piece of data? Well, the, the, the metadata that's generated, the weights in the, the sort of the settings in the, the model, you, you can't kind of fish your own data back out. And so that's an interesting new space we have entered into, mm -hmm. thinking about boundaries and, and ownership. And, you know, let me give a couple of examples of how a lot of our customers, a lot of enterprises are bringing really novel ways that are really impacting humanity in a very positive way. So the Chicago Department of Public Health um, they took our AI models and they were able to train it on a lot of patient data. And what they discovered is that when you go like 10 to 15 miles outside of downtown Chicago, life expectancy goes down. They were then able to analyze it and figure out that it was because of different access to healthcare and certain preventative medicines were not being given, were not uh, easily access to those people. So they were able to steer the healthcare to address that. And that's a huge outcome. We have customers, uh, Coke being one of them, you know, Coke, SKF, Baxter. They have taken these models and they have deployed it in their factories. Now, you know, if you have seen a machine operate, when the machine is about to break, it kind of starts vibrating in a different way. And so what these companies have done is that they've taken these models and they've trained it on the kind of vibration that these machines do. And so we have sensors in Amazon, we call them Monitron. And so these sensors are put on these machines 
they take the pressure, the temperature and the vibrations, and then machine learning models predict when the machine is about to break. Hmm. And so now technicians are able to use AI to do predictive maintenance and make their lives a lot better. And so there are a lot of veterans affairs, you know, the Department of Veterans Affairs is working with us on generative AI. And they're now coming up with uh, a functionality where veterans will be able to, just like chat GPT, they'll be able to go and ask questions and say, you know, what are the benefits that I'm entitled to and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of, you know, I don't want to kind of make it just one side that is always going to be all good. I think we yep. need to have a balanced view of it. But the one thing that I also wanted to communicate is, you know, at Amazon today, we have more than 100,000 enterprises using AI and machine learning. And so there's a lot of good that's happening. And, you know, we want to be able to use it in a responsible way, but there's a lot of good that's already mm -hmm. happening. Deb, do you want to add any other use cases or particularly interesting ones? And they don't have to be good that you've seen in the <laughs> last eight months. Could use some nuance here. Well, I, <clears throat> I think that, um, wait, for, uh, I'm curious, who, who was at the morning session, just for kind of context? Okay, so <laughs> you, you heard it's not all good, that there are some reasons for concern. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think of, um, so clearly large language models are powerful. Um, and like every powerful language technology before them, they're a dual-edged sword, right? So you can, it's, it's almost like any use case, um, you can imagine um, unintended consequences, sometimes predictable consequences that could be the downside. That doesn't mean we shouldn't pursue those use cases, but keeping them in mind and, and sort of keeping those in balance. So um, I think this is true of if you go back in time for language technologies, you could consider the spoken word, but certainly the printed word and the printing press and yeah. broadcast media. In each case, uh, there's uh, harms that you can introduce um, and there's a, a period of disruption. Um, large language models, almost a kind of magical in their qualities, right? But is, is fundamentally a language technology. So um, I'll give you one use case that my, uh, so I, I lead a, uh, research Center for Constructive Communication at MIT. And we have been experimenting with large language models, uh, which are extraordinarily good at uh, emulating any style you, you wish. So we've worked with uh, media partners. In fact, we, before, long before ChatGPT, worked with Frontline, documentary filmmaker, um, who was having trouble reaching uh, an audience that was becoming more and more politically fragmented. They were losing their right-leaning audience, which historically they've always had a politically balanced audience. So we used language models, large language models, to rewrite their marketing copy as they were promoting new documentaries. There was a human in the loop, but it was a human's, uh, the, the marketing team's language choices often had unintended biases. Right. Um, if you were, use the word lived experience versus life experience, you're talking to two different parts of America. Mm. These models know these sorts of subtleties. So this is an example for me of a positive use case of helping someone who is intending to reach a, uh, a, a diverse audience um, actually reflect on and correct their own blind spots. Could you measure that effect? <clears throat> Yes, we did. So we ran A-B uh, field experiments where we ran marketing campaigns with the two different kinds of language and saw that the um, partisan gap was reduced by about 20% when the machine uh, helped the humans write. That same technology can be used to create social wedges and drive people apart. Right? So it's totally dual yeah. use. So there's, one, there's a, a lot of examples like this where, uh, I'll just give one more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, w w there's a lot of excitement for good reason in the educational space. So if there's one uncontroversial point, uh, fact in, in, this, in this sort of education domain, is nothing beats personal tutoring as, as a way to learn. Um, so what could possibly go wrong if we I can think of a kids. few things. <laughs> well, let's say we got rid of hallucinations, and we had grounded AI and all the rest. But that's a big if, isn't it? But say we did all okay. those things. Still, what could go wrong? Um, so if you wanted to put on your dystopian hat, you could say, well, what if we end up having our first generation of children raised by machines? Because if that gives the child everything they need and you have this one-dimensional view of what it means to learn, it's a kind of information processing task, there could be a kind of disintermediation of, of humans mm -hmm. having to deal with annoying classmates and teachers and all the rest. So there is actually ways you can 
Isn't that part, I mean, someone else could argue that that's part of your life skills, is dealing with annoying classmates, bad teachers. Absolutely, so, but there is a, so it's just a, there is a, a way to think about education where everything you get in school, if you kind of focus on what these large language models are good at, they're not, they could also be good at helping you get along with your classmates, mm -hmm. just like we could help frontline get along, right. you know, connect with, but there's different ways you can deploy the same technology and accidentally uh, isolate Right. People. And it's this idea, right, that each kid could have their own tutor with an IQ of 140 that is infinitely patient, that knows exactly what they need, yeah. right? But let me, let me look at the flip side of this, sort of on the business case as well. Um, it was a few months ago, Bertine, you said you have, you know, hundreds of thousands of customers on AWS. Um, we often look at the company side and the business models that have opportunities are here or going to be eviscerated by generative AI not really so clear cut, but Chegg, which is an education technology company which provides tutors, I think their stock went down like 30% or something, 20, 30% in one session because investors realized that generative AI could replace exactly what they did. How do you, with so many different customers, enterprise customers across so many different business models, how do you think of that? And how are you gonna tailor this new program that Amazon has to each individual business, one that may have an opportunity here, one that may be killed by generative AI? You know, ultimately we think it's really important for customers to figure out, companies to figure out how they're going to use AI as part of the strategy. You know, this is really the relentless march of technology. You want to be able to leverage the latest tools and the latest benefits to be able to do that. Like I'll give you one example that goes from the last um, example that Deb and you were talking about, the, um, you could be a software company today and you could say, I'm going to do software the way it was always done. Or you could say, you know what, I'm going to harness generative AI to do software and to do more software, to do more, pro no, more productive software. So today you have uh, products like Amazon Code Whisperer where you just type in English and it gives code out to you. And we have seen that it makes software developers more than 50% productive, 50% more productive. So I think the key in here is that you want really to be able to figure out how you leverage technology to do more. I'll give you another example from Amazon. You know, in our fulfillment centers, we used robots, a lot of yeah. robotics, right? And there was a fear that, okay, if you're using robotics, that would lead to um, other consequences. Now, it it would turns, eliminate jobs, would right? Eliminate that was the big jobs, fear. Right? Now, it turns out that because we were using robots, we were able to service a lot more customers than we would otherwise have been. Right. And as a result of servicing a lot more customers, we were able to grow the business a lot more. And in, gen in return, it actually created more jobs than if it hadn't used robots. So you're asking a great question, Dee. I think today, every company and every board should really be thinking about how do we leverage this technology to make our employees more productive, mm -hmm. make our customer service more friendly, innovate more with products because you really can use this to transform your business. Deb, how certain can we be that AI is going to create higher skilled, more efficient jobs versus just wiping out a ton of jobs? Um, not very. If the question is how certain we can be, um, I, I think that it's not the first time we have a, a powerful technology um, that is clearly going to display some uh, you know, significant part of what people spend their time doing. Um, the speed at which it has arrived is new, right? I mean, I think uh, when people have looked for an analogy of how pervasive and sort of significant m might this be, you know, if we, again, I think there's a lot of reason to believe some of the core challenges like hallucinations and so forth, there are ways to to uh, address them, so let's assume those those happen. That this might be a technology on par with electricity. If you think about electricity, imagine when most of uh, work was physical, and now you could take this magical cable, plug it in <laughs> to the right kind of machines, and those machines could do more physical labor than than any human, um, and that just has a, a extraordinary effect in displacing labor. But that took decades, and. Now we are, you know, as Peter Drucker imagined, we would enter this knowledge economy. By the way, the whole world hasn't, but big parts of the, of the world are now. The, kind of the major part of the economy is knowledge economy. Is 
large language models and kind of related models the equivalent of electricity for knowledge workers? Um, if so, and it arrives in two to five years instead of, I don't know, two to five decades, I'm not a historian of, of what happened with electrical, um, but it's probably order of magnitude faster. Hmm. Um, that's destabilizing, right, in mm -hmm. terms of just what it means for for uh, individuals and for communities and societally. So um, getting into details of specific, yeah. there are some, you know, I do know people and they're kind of quiet about it, but like, for example, in the marketing space, yeah. um, things have become automated. Now, um, do you take out the agency, the middleman, if you have AI doing all or, that? Or, um, you know, do you thin the staff? Yeah. And, and then look at it from the point of view of that person who might be a senior person in marketing. Um, what is that person to do? Right. So that, those things are they're actually happening now. They've been happening over the last few months. Another space that it's happening right now that we're seeing <clears throat> disruption in this play out is writers in Hollywood, right, Bertine? Um, we're figuring out what that means, but clearly there's a group of creatives who doesn't think that this kind of generative AI is going to be good for them, good for the creative industry, for the movie and TV industry. What do you, what do you make of that? How long do we have to figure this out too? You know, I think there are a couple of aspects. One is we really look upon this as creative assistance. Like, you know, this is the place where you're creating the first draft of something that then makes it um, easier for you to generate subsequent drafts. And, you know, for most of us, you know, we are running with very tight deadlines, right? And we wish that there was something that would generate those first drafts quicker so we didn't have those kind mm -hmm. of tight deadlines. Um, I think it's also true that the nature of work might change. And I think at Amazon especially, we also think that we should all work together to see what are the appropriate guardrails that you put in terms of using this technology. But the key thing, you know, I'm an optimist in technology. We have had these technological evolutions all the time. And in general and overall, we have seen that technology has done more good. And, you know, this is one of those transitions that I think we'll just work through. Mm -hmm. The idea behind, behind that, Deb, is that more intelligence has always been good for humankind, right? It's led to better quality of life, um, us living longer. Is there, can you find fault with that? Well, I always see kind of two sides to yeah. things like that. So, uh, you know, I think there's a, it's a very general question you've asked, but I, I think about how we think about progress in technology. If you just sort of zoom out a little bit, um, there's a, a kind of definition, at least a, say a Western definition of progress where being able to act at a distance with more ease. Mm -hmm. um, so think about the evolution of transportation, right? I, I can now get what I want from anywhere in the world with less and less friction. Uh, in communication, being able to reach a distance, obviously the internet, kind of the, the uh, ultimate form of that. Weaponry, being able to kill at a distance. We heard about click to kill, right? Just taking the friction out. So action at a distance, the more you can act with little friction and kind of collapse, kind of spatial distance, has been one way to define progress. And there's obviously incredible upside. We're all here and enjoying the benefits of that. Mm -hmm. There is a downside, which um, is as you have the ability to act at a distance, the repercussions, the potential negative effects of your action are also at a distance. And it takes longer for that feedback loop to come back. In control theory, when you think about self-regulation, how do uh, animals and uh, humans self-regulate? How as communities do we self-regulate? Ecology self-regulate? The good kind of feedback, uh, it's a little paradoxical, is called negative feedback. It's that negative feedback that tells you hmm. how to correct your behavior. And as you act at a distance, that negative feedback becomes more and more diffuse. You can do a lot of damage before you realize the damage has been done. So there's something about the, the, mm. the kind of downside. Yeah. And I'm a technologist. I, I, you know, I, I, my PhD was in language modeling. So I've been you know, in the space for a long time. But the, the ability to have this kind of power, the unintended consequences right. Right, become more and more mm -hmm. difficult to predict. That is, in general, my worry. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm not like against enlightenment and you know stuff like that. <laughs> against but enlightenment. There, but there is a, uh, that's that's a fair point though um, to consider. I want to spend the last few minutes before we open up for questions, sort of on some more practical questions. Bertine, you're a good person to ask about this. Um, 
you know, I use my Alexa all the time at home. Um, it's easier than getting on the phone in front of my kids and everything. How are we going to be using the internet? Does search, does the browser change or go away altogether? What do you think? I think you will likely be using a lot more of um, AI-powered assistant, potentially. Like, you can imagine today you would have to go in and say, like, you know, we had to do, okay, we need to get to Aspen for the Aspen Ideas Festival, and where do we stay, and when do we get in, and all of those. You can imagine you would be able to just send a question to an assistant and say, hey, I need to go to Aspen, and I need to be in time for this, and by the way, I need to arrive the day earlier because, you know, I need to attend a dinner and so on and so forth. Where are you typing that question or are you, you saying know, it? You're just saying or is it. An app? You know, you just you, say ultimately, it. you're just saying it. Like, ultimately, there's probably an Alexa and you're saying, hey, Alexa, there's uh, this thing next week. Just plan this trip out. Or from, Siri. Or, or Siri assistant. or someone else. <laughs> Siri, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, any one someone. of these speakers. Maybe so, Sydney. <laughs> uh, yeah. So you can imagine <laughs> that we are ultimately going to go there where that would be able to, that thing mm -hmm. would be able to translate your voice, uh, your interaction, be able to just search the internet, get the best deals, and do the work for you. Comes back to the idea of an assistant, right? Because that voice, whatever it is talking to you, knows exactly your preferences, where you've traveled before, what you're looking for, what kind of you know high-end, low-end, budget, expensive hotel, right? So that makes it... Yeah. And you know that is where different than search today. Yeah, and that is where the notion that we talked about before that you may want its choice and flexibility thing is so important because there might be some use cases where you don't need that personalization. There will be some other use cases where you need that personalization, and so that is why this right. notion of giving choice and flexibility to customers is so core to what we are doing at Amazon, mm -hmm. and we think is really essential um, as this field evolves. Deb, should I be worried about the questions I'm asking, chat, GPT, or Bard? Because sometimes I ask really dumb questions, and I think, who's going to see this? They know my username. They know who I am. How careful do you have to be with how you're getting data and inputting data at the moment? Well, there are companies that know a thing or two about the space that have told their employees to stop using these yeah. services, right? Um, so <clears throat> I think I haven't read the fine print of chat, GPT. I am generally careful of what I type in. Um, I play with it a lot, but I'm careful not to put in things that feel personal or revealing. I haven't read the fine print, which may shift over time, so I'm not, not sure. And each company you know, will have different policies, but the ability for these models to memorize verbatim um, is, uh, I mean, they, they have, again, huge memory capacity and, and right. can memorize things verbatim and reproduce them, and so there's uh, in general, risk, but I think the, I think you know, OpenAI recently addressed that risk to some degree. Hmm. But it depends on the. Should individuals and businesses be worried? So that's a great question, D. Um, I think one of the things that um, you know, customers, individuals, everyone are really concerned about, and rightfully so, about making sure that their data remains private. And so one of the things that we are doing at Amazon, and I, as I would assume others would do as well is that you can create, when a customer comes in, when an enterprise comes in, they can say, create my own copy of this data. So there's something, uh, my own copy of this model. So there's something called, uh, you know, fine tuning. And when you do that, you create your own copy of the model. And what that means is when you are sending information, that information doesn't go to anyone else. That information just stays in your private copy of the model. Should they be worried about Amazon having that? <laughs> You know, we privacy and security and operational excellence is job number one for us. It has always been the case. And, you know, that's why more customers are on AWS than anyone else. <laughs> there we go. Mm. Um, it raises the question, though, and this conversation we were having sort of earlier on in our discussion about data being the new gold. And how do startups, new companies, build in that environment? if you're only starting at the beginning of that journey collecting data is, and I guess my question, maybe I'll start with you, Deb, is, is big tech destined to be the winner here? Are they gonna be the gatekeepers? Are they gonna be creating the open and closed source models? I mean, currently, the what are called these foundation models, um, uh, like uh, GPT-4, the resources that are required to train them um, only a handful of companies have the resources. You know, OpenAI is now, you know, 
moving out of a startup into established, you know, a significant company, but has the uh, the backing of Microsoft and right. and their their uh, their compute resources, you know. Billions of dollars have already been spent in training these models. So, um, most small startups don't have that kind of capital. You know, a well resourced now startup in this space is raising hundreds of millions of dollars to, to do kind of competitive things. And there's, so there is a, um, a real competitive um, sort of uh, moat there. Uh, yeah. So, some of the large companies right now are in that position. Um, and um, I think that's a reason for. Potential concern. Well, I I'll tell you one, you know, data piece on this. If you look at, you know, there's this leaderboard called Helm uh, that ranks all these foundation models, large language mm. models. Helm. Helm. H E L M. Uh, if you go in there, most of the models there are actually from startups. Hmm. So Cohere, Anthropic, AI21, Stability. You know, these are all just startups. Um, you know, we were talking about the assistance before. Some of the most um, important innovation in there is happening to startups. So, yeah. you know, you're also in the Bay Area. So if you look at the amount of innovation happening in startups there, um, it's just incredible. Mm -hmm. So I do think there's a lot of innovation that's going to happen, and it's going to happen all over the place. I want to know why it's still happening in the Bay Area. But first, to finish off this discussion, a lot of the startups I talk to, um, what's so important if you're building these models is your access to GPUs, which is an advanced type of chip. NVIDIA makes the most popular one um, that is in short supply right now. So there's some venture capitalists who are offering not necessarily money, but access to GPUs. Um, how does Amazon think about that? How do you prioritize? Because you have. Large enterprises, you also have a lot of small and medium-sized businesses and startups. How are you finding that sort of balance? And what you can know, you offer them? So we have GPUs. Um, we also have our own processors that we are building now. Mm -hmm. um, and those processors, there's actually a different angle to um, generative AI that we probably didn't touch, but that's also very important, is these models take a humongous amount of compute. And so sustainability gets important. And so at Amazon, we actually have been building our own processors. These are called Trainium and Inferentia that are up to 50% more power efficient. So they actually help sustainability. And so we have our <coughs> own processors and we have a huge you know, experience in supply chain management and getting them. Mm -hmm. You know, the world needs more GPUs um, at the same time. Uh, you know, we have we have a lot of experience on doing that. We have our own processors that now a lot of customers can use. Yeah. Um, and I think that actually helps customers a lot. The other side of this is it is so expensive to run a large language model, the size and scope of, say, an open AI. I recently asked a venture capitalist this. Could an open AI exist right now on its own without a backer like a Microsoft or an, without a huge cloud player to give them that compute power? Deb, what do you think? He said no. Well, just by the numbers, if you want to literally match what they're doing, the answer is no. Is um, that worrying? But, but I think the fact that I, there was this uh, leaked model from Meta that a lot of the now research community has um, been experimenting with and evolving it really depends on your, you know, the purposes. Um, but the most powerful models, um, I, I think, just the factual answer is no. Those resources are out of reach for um, uh, all but the biggest players. However, if they make them available, you know, you can fine tune those models, use them for your own purposes. So there's, you know, as, as long as the business model supports that, if at some point. It didn't. You know, we've. It's interesting again to look at analogies with social media. There was a period where, uh, take Twitter, there was a whole ecology of apps that were built. These are viable businesses. Ditto with Facebook. And at some point, the business logic for the company changed, and they pulled back access and a whole set. You're of talking about products that Twitter used to have. Um, yeah. Like, uh, the, what was the TikTok? Um, so there were precursor. So the way it worked. Fine. You. Uh, you could create games and you know uh, third-party apps that would use the social media platform as a kind of base layer. Mm -hmm. Call it the equivalent of a foundational model, it's like a foundational network. Um, but if the company changes its mind, um, if the business logic changes, um, 
there's a dependency there, right. right? So that dependency is real. If if you need to leverage or wish to leverage the most powerful model. There's I, one aspect yeah. I wanted to briefly touch and on. And then I want to get to Q&A, so um, get ready for your question. And that is the role of open source. <clears throat> and now there are, as you know, Dave was alluding to it, now there are a lot of open source models that are actually competitive with some of the best models. Uh, in fact, you know, a couple of weeks back at Amazon, there was um, one of the most competitive open source models called Falcon that was actually released uh, as well. And now you can take a lot of these open source models. Many customers are actually doing it. Uh, you know, we have a lot of our customers who are now just starting with those open source models and then tuning it. So mm -hmm. that would be another great thing that democratize, democratizes the use of this technology. Right. Um, let's go to questions. I've got, I think I saw you in the green shirt first. Okay, question. So uh, I'm not sure if you read the, the uh, link memo from Google. Oh, thank you. Trace Sutton. I have an AI company in healthcare. So I was curious if you read the, the leak memo from Google where they talked about we don't have a moat, open AI doesn't either. And then also, you know, my experience has been like clients don't care about, you know, 0.3 increase in area under the curve. They care about like actionability, explainability, and actually getting results. And so could you rationalize some of your commentary with that memo and, and kind of what the experience with my clients has been? Yeah, so I'm familiar with that memo. And, you know, I think it goes back to, you know, the question even Dee was asking, which is choice and flexibility is going to be really, really important. Okay. I don't think one single company should try to create a moat and so on and so forth. Um, and I think the other part that that uh, memo talked about was the rise of open source, and it also talked about new ways of training and so on. And I think, you know, there's just so much innovation that's happening across the board that we think it's going to be difficult to say one model, one company will have the right answers. And that is why, you know, I, I think that our foundational tenet of choice and flexibility and enabling people to innovate and also enabling open source, all of that is really what's going to be important. And that is why we at Amazon are really betting on the choice and flexibility. And you know that memo basically says the same thing, is that there's so much choice and flexibility that's coming that's going to be difficult for one company to own it all. Question right behind you on the yellow shirt. Hello, so um, I'm a college student, so I found your notes on uh, the impact on education very interesting. And I've noticed that a lot of my classmates are also using ChatGBT for things like answering homework questions, um, <laughs> writing essays, things like that. So do you think that there's going to have to be uh, limitations on that, or do you think it's marking an adaptation of the education space to accommodate for that? Yeah, I think um, adaptation is already the path we're on. <clears throat> in some cases, the fact that you can do your homework and, and get an A plus, right? Or, or maybe you get an F because it's, you, it was too good what you submitted, um, is saying something about what we're testing for mm. in, in, in some cases. I think there's creative things that I, I, I know some of my colleagues have been doing, having the, the human critique the AI output just to kind of create reflective and critical mm. skills. Um, so, I, the thing that worries me more, uh, my, my uh, niece just graduated from uh, uh, an MBA program and said that pretty much every classmate uh, uses ChatGPT continuously in, in their work. Um, and they are using it as an equivalent of a, uh, a search yes. engine, right? And it's not grounded. It is hallucinating. Mm -hmm. And that is feeding you know, uh, in, into a lot, a lot of people are using it that way. Um, so there, there's a concern there about just how factual, right, are, um, are the resources uh, that people are relying on. What age do you think ChatGPT should be introduced to kids? You know, I think we want to get into a mode where we are trying to leverage this technology. And I'll give you an example from myself. You know, when I was small, um, you know, my parents would tell me, don't use a calculator do the math by yourself, and that is how you learn how to do math. Now, I, you know, I don't do that with my kids, but um, I think the fact- They have free reign of the calculator? <laughs> yes. Okay. So, <laughs> Mine just asked Alexa, it's very annoying. <laughs> but I think it's going to ultimately get to that point where, you know, we really want to 
figure out how we embrace this technology. And I'm not saying we should give it free reign. You know, I'm not um, going to go that far. But I think ultimately we want to find out how we are able to leverage this technology so that kids and employees and all of us can do more with less. What's the age? I'm looking for a number. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I would... So today, if a kid, whenever they're looking at the internet and browsing, um, I would let them go in and ask those same questions okay. with Chat GPT. Yeah, we, uh, I co-instructed with a number of my students a, a class on generative AI this just this last semester, and several of the class projects were actually looking at the educational use case. And one of the things that's obvious is that these models are, you know, in no way fine-tuned or trained for dealing with children, and so kind of, you know, a, this idea of age-appropriate interactions. Are, is not something that are in the models, and that may run pretty deep. Like it's yeah. not clear whether you can fine tune your way out of that. We just don't know. But the students didn't have much trouble. So you think older then? Uh, uh, yes, or um, you know, with guardrails uh, coming from uh, humans, not the technology. Maybe you could have like a you. child chat. I think, yeah, I think you know you'll <laughs> ultimately get to a point because today you can imagine a child can go on the internet and search many sites, but yeah. then if you do it through a chat GPT, you can actually have filters yeah. that say, make sure you're only sending this kind of appropriate content because you can scan the content before you send it to the kid. Mm -hmm. And of course, the idea that children can just go on the internet uh, yeah. itself is, uh, <laughs> we've just accepted that, but you know, you have to learn how to drive before you get on the road, but you don't have to be licensed to be on the internet. And I'm sorry we've reached the end, guys. That was such a good discussion. We could have gone for longer. Um, but thank you, everyone. What, can we do one more? OK, sorry, I saw someone back here. One more um, in the white scarf, please. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Diana Lady Dugan, Center for Strategic and International Studies and Cyber Century Forum. This is the first time I've heard anyone talk about education. and. If I may humbly suggest, and in fact, I've gotten backed into catalyzing some initiatives uh, relating to teaching children how to not only use AI, but I look at uh, they, how do they learn critical thinking? How do they learn to learn? How do they learn the ethics? Uh, how do they learn to question and challenge? And I look at the latest thing, my, my 14-year-old grandson was using chat GPT to um, do a paper mm -hmm. last uh, semester. And he was, of course, very proud of it. And he's very smart, but they're still thinking this is so cool, and so yeah. this is what they should embrace. Is there anyone that you know of who's really taking the, I'm, I'm working with two universities right now, but is there anyone that you know of who is really um, taking charge in terms of programs directed at kids yeah, as opposed to parental or schools kind of saying, uh, these are the rules. MIT has, uh, I'm sure there are many others, MIT has a pretty significant K through 12 AI education program. Uh, in fact, Amazon is a partner. There's a, there's a whole program with many faculty involved and, and school partners. Uh, I guess I'll just make one last comment about this, which is, um, I think we all individually and as parents and as communities and as society as, as a whole um, are going to be faced with many choices for how we bring this powerful technology into our lives. And one way to just think about a metaphor is, um, is this the equivalent of a kind of crutch that you become dependent on? And because you grew up with calculators, you can no longer do basic arithmetic. Mm -hmm. or, or is it um, to be used as training wheels mm -hmm. that actually help you skill up and maybe sometimes you cast away because now you can just cycle. Yeah. Um, there's a choice and I think, you know, I, I don't know if the studies have been done of what happened with calculators becoming pervasive, yeah. what's happened to our, our uh, um, arithmetic skills. I'm sure there's a distribution across, you know, people. So as we think about uh, our kids, I hope they're training wheels and mm. not, not crutches. That was a great question. I'm glad that we got that in. Thank you, everyone, for participating and listening. Thank you. For